Welcome back to my complete AP Chemistry course on YouTube. My name is Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to be looking at photoelectron spectroscopy, which is something that always appears very uh, prominently on the AP Chemistry exam. Now the reason that we're talking about this is that there are some major flaws in the Bohr model of the atom. Now you might recall that we looked at a picture of this here, and this was an example of the neon atom in the last video. Now, Niels Bohr understood all the electrons in an energy level, or an electron shell, as it's sometimes called, to be identical to each other. And so he imagined that there were, for example, two electrons buzzing around, or perhaps orbiting, in a circular orbit in the first energy level. And he had eight electrons in the outermost energy level of neon. He imagined they were all identical, all uh, orbiting in that, uh, in a circular orbit there, or spherical orbit. Now, today we know that that's not the case. In fact, we have some evidence that the Bohr model of the atom, as he explained it anyway, was actually incorrect. Because today we have this method of stripping electrons away from a nucleus, one by one, to determine the successive ionization energies of an element. And so since neon has 10 electrons, we can actually strip every one of those electrons away and calculate a first and then a second ionization energy all the way up to a tenth ionization energy since there are 10 electrons in that atom. Now, we found that once we get to about the second energy level or so, we find that it actually takes more energy to strip away some of these electrons than it does to strip away others. And this is what photoelectron spectroscopy has shown us. And so let's take a look at the photoelectron uh, spectroscopy readout here for neon. And so here we have a diagram of that. And, you know, we have two energy levels in neon, but as you can see, we have three peaks. And so something must be different here. You know, these three photoelectron spectroscopy, or PES peaks, tell us that this atom has three sublevels. And so each peak in the PES diagram represents a sublevel. Now you might recall from first year chemistry that we give those names. We start with the 1s, and then we have 2s, and then after that we have 2p. That gets filled next. And we could progressively move on with that. We have 3s and 3p and then 4s, and then 3d, and 4p, and it just keeps on going, doesn't it? We recall how to write electron configurations, uh, hopefully from first year chemistry. If not, you can watch my video on that as well. Now, the last peak, so we have three peaks going from left to right. The last peak, this one right here, the one here that's the tallest, that always is gonna have the lowest ionization energy. And that makes sense because the number here is by far the lowest. It's only 2.08 megajoules per mole for that one. And that makes sense because those last electrons are the easiest to remove electrons as opposed to the core electrons. Look at that, 84 million joules per mole to take those away. Now the height of the peak represents the number of electrons in that sublevel. And so we might remember that 1s has two electrons, right? Well, that, the height of that represents the two. So we're going to put the two in there. And then since the 2s has the same height, it's also two. And the 2p peak is actually three times as tall as those other two peaks. So that means it has three times as many electrons. So that's why we, we have a six for that one, 2p6. And so this is the photoelectron spectroscopy diagram for neon, as you can see. And let's try an example with PES for an element that perhaps we don't know. So here is a PES uh, diagram for this element. And first of all, let's label each of the peaks with its corresponding sublevel. Now remember, in these, uh, in these diagrams, we always go from left to right, starting with 1s and then 2s and 2p. So that means that this first uh, peak here 
is going to be the 1S diagram, or peak rather, and then the second peak would have to be 2S, because that's next, and then we know that 2P would be the last peak, so we have uh, the labels on each of those. Now the second part of this, state how many electrons are in each sublevel. Well hopefully you remember from first year chemistry that it takes two electrons to fill the 1s. So that's, you know, that's kind of a given. And then the 2s has the same height as the 1s, doesn't it? So it's got to be the same number of electrons, too. Well, what about the 2p? Can you figure out how many electrons are in that? Since the height is only half as tall as the one next to it, that means it has only half as many electrons. So this would have to be 2p1. Now, Let's identify the element. Can you re remember back to first year chemistry to think of an element that ends with 2p1? Now, even if you've forgotten all, the, uh, all those electron configurations, you can take the superscripts and add those together. 2 plus 2 plus 1 and get a total of 5 electrons. Do you know which element has a total of 5 electrons? Well. Even if you know nothing about electron configurations, hopefully you know that that one is boron. Now, the fourth part here is a little bit harder. We're going to calculate the first ionization energy per electron for this element in the units of joules per electron. Well, the way that we do that is we have to remember that the first ionization energy involves how much energy it takes to pull away the very last electron. So in this case, it's the 2p electron. So we're going to use this number right here, the 0.80 megajoules per mole. And we're going to convert the 0.80 megajoules per mole to joules per electron. So the first thing that we probably need to do here is convert megajoules to joules. So in my first conversion factor, I'm going to put megajoules on the bottom and joules on the top. And hopefully from our SI prefixes, we know that there are a million joules in a megajoule. So once we know that, we can cancel out the megajoules. We're now in units of joules per mole. But we don't want to be in joules per mole. We want to be in joules per electron. So in our next conversion factor, we need to put one mole on the top and then electrons on the bottom. How many electrons are in a mole of electrons? Well, hopefully you remember back to Avogadro's number and realize that it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd electrons in a mole. You know, there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of anything in a in a mole of objects, right? So we can cancel out moles top, top and bottom. And now do the arithmetic on this. 0.80 times a million divided by Avogadro's number. And we get an answer of 1.3 times 10 to the negative 18th joules per electron. So that's the first ionization energy of, of, uh, of uh, the element boron here. And we can actually calculate that very easily using PES. Let's take a look at another example here. We're going to look at this PES diagram. And the first question says label the PES diagram for the element and identify it. So once again, we're going to progress from left to right. And so this first one here, the first peak is always 1s. And then the next one is always 2s and then it goes 2p, and then after that is 3s, and then 3p, and 4s. So we can label the, the sublevels for each one of these. Now, please remember that 1s is always 2, and so all those with the same height will be 2 as well. So we take care of our s's there. And the p's, well, notice those are three times as tall. So that means it has to have three times as many electrons as the s's. So that would be, you know, 2 times 3 is 6. So we have a 2p6 and a 3p6. Now, let's identify the element. You can do this two different ways. You can add up the superscripts and see that there are 20 electrons total. Or perhaps you can remember back to first year chemistry that 4s2 was calcium. So we have that part of it. Now let's go on to the second part. Let's calculate the wavelength 
in meters of electromagnetic radiation that's needed to remove an electron from the valence shell of an atom of the element. Now, we have a lot of words there. It seems, sometimes it seems like it just, one just goes by the other, but this is a very doable problem. Remember, we're trying to remove an electron from the valence shell in this element. We're trying to remove an electron. And so that means it's going to have something to do with this right here, the 0 0.980 times 10 to the minus 18th, because that's the valence shell, the 4s, the 4s2. That's your outermost. So we're going to use that number. And notice that it's joules per electron that are the units given to us here in that. So it's, we're going to take the 0 0.980, and we're going to uh, determine the the actual frequency of this, okay? And then, once we get the frequency, we're going to find the wavelength using c equals lambda nu. So, this time, it actually tells us what the e is. Okay, so we're going to plug in the 0 0.980 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. That's right out of the, the PES diagram here. And h is Planck's constant that we learned in the previous video. So that's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. And we define the frequency. So that's our unknown. When we uh, divide 0.98 times 10 to the minus 18th by 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34th, we get that the frequency is 1.48 times 10 to the 15th hertz. So that's the frequency. Now remember, the problem's not asking for the frequency. It says up here to calculate the wavelength in meters. So we have the frequency. We're halfway there. We just have to plug this now into c equals lambda nu to find the frequency like it's asking for us. Or, I'm sorry, uh, to find the, the wavelength. So c is 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The... Uh, uh, the wavelength is what we're trying to solve for, the lambda. We know what nu is. It's the 1.48 times 10 to the 15th hertz that we got from the last part of the problem. Now we just have to plug that in and, div and divide. And we get that the wavelength is 2.03 times 10 to the minus 7th meters. Or if you prefer to put it in nanometers, that would be 203 nanometers when you just uh, multiply that by... Uh, 10 to the ninth. Now, interesting question here. What type of electromagnetic magnetic radiation is that? You know, 200 nanometers sounds like it's pretty close to visible light. Let's compare that to our visible light spectrum here. And we notice that 203 is actually just a little bit to the left here. So 203 would be somewhere, you know, to the left of that. So it's not really visible light, is it? In fact, we'd say that it's you know, past violet, so that would be ultraviolet. So this is UV light that we're talking about here in this problem. So just an interesting little detail there. Now notice that throughout this lesson, we've talked about two types of electrons. We've talked about the valence electrons. Those are the electrons in the outermost electron shell, the very last energy level of an atom. Now all the other electrons, the ones that are not valence electrons, we call those core electrons. Those are in the other inner energy levels uh, of an atom. And so those are uh, pretty important as well, but not usually as important to the chemistry as the valence electrons. And so if we look at the PES diagram of calcium that we had a few, a few minutes ago, we have the valence electrons that are in the outermost and I want you to notice that the valence electrons are bound with much less energy than the core electrons. And that's why the binding energy that binds them in there is so much less than it is for the core electrons. Look at some of these. They're like over 600 times, 70 times, 56 times, several times what the valence electrons are bound to that uh, nucleus with. Now, if we take a look at an application of this, we can actually use this idea here to find the successive ionization energies of an element. Now, we said that using PES, we can actually one by one 
remove every single electron from an atom until they're all gone and find the successive ionization energies. Now calcium, as an example, has 20 electrons. And we're talking about calcium here in this diagram. So calcium, in theory, has 20 ionization energies. First and all the way up to the 20th. And notice that every one gets higher. For space, I only have the first six on here. I want you to notice that there's a big jump. You know, from the first to the second, it about doubles or so. But from the first to the second ionization energy, I want you to notice that there is a huge jump from the second to the third ionization energy. It's over four times as much to go from the second to the third. Now, to go from the third to the fourth, it, it goes up, but not nearly as much of a jump as we had from second to the third. Now, this tells us that since there's this huge jump right in here, that tells us that calcium has two valence electrons, and that the third electron that you remove is going to be a core electron. Now, we can use this information to actually predict what elements we have. If we have an unknown element here, let's say we have an unknown element, and we're trying to determine what that unknown element is using PES, well, we can do that as well. And so, let's say we use this list of successive ionization energies of an element in kilojoules per mole. Okay? Now, based on the certain elements' successive ionization energies, can we figure out which of these four elements it's most likely to be? I think we can. The first thing we have to do is try to figure out where is the huge jump in this series. Do you see where it is? You know, we have an, an, an increase in each one of these, but do you notice that from the third to the fourth, it jumps significantly? It's like almost, looks like it's almost quadrupling, you know? So can we see how many valence electrons this atom must have? You know, that tells us that the third electron must be a valence and the fourth, the fourth electron must be a core electron. You know, so this atom must have three valence electrons because of that list of successive ionization energies. Now we just have to go to the four choices and figure out which of those has three valence electrons. And based upon what we learned in first year chemistry, we know that all the atoms in group 13 are going to have three valence electrons. And so that would, be, that would mean that aluminum is the only one that this could be. By the way, there are multiple choice questions on the AP exam that often look almost identical to this. Well, I hope you've learned something. I hope you've learned something about uh, PES, photoelectron spectroscopy. I hope I've, able, I've been able to make this easy for you, or at least easier. If you enjoyed the video or learned a little bit of chemistry from this, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. We're going to go through the entire AP Chemistry uh, curriculum in this uh, series of videos. And so I hope to see you again on my channel where we can learn some more chemistry together.